Hello and welcome to Moderate Fantasy Violence, a podcast about pop culture and the world around it. I'm Nick. And I'm Alistair. And this fortnight, we're finally making the comics podcast of my dreams as we look at recent superhero relaunches, Immortal Hulk by Al Ewing and Joe Bennett, and Man of Steel number one, the new Superman relaunch by Brian Michael Bendis and Ivan Weiss. And then after that, we'll be having a, a bit of a chat about how they compare and what they say about the Marvel versus DC approach. So a bit of a shake up to the format, but what do you want? It's our format. But yeah, before we finally get onto the comics, Alistair, have you consumed anything else this fortnight? Well, I went to see a little-known independent film starring Chris Pratt and Bryce Dallas Howard called uh, okay. Jurassic World's Fallen Kingdom. Which, yeah, I, I thought it was good. I was very much on the fence as I went in, in the sense that I kind of wanted to approach it with you know as open mind as possible. I did really like Jurassic World starring the same two actors. You know, obviously, there's been a few turkeys in the franchise, like well, ma- most of the other films apart from the original Jurassic Park. <laughs> and also the original Jurassic Park is like quite close to me when I was like a teenager and first really getting into film the original Jurassic Park was my favorite film for a long time and it really does stand up as like a great action cinematic experience yeah I have a lot of fond memories of that even as a a, a known non-film person I saw Jurassic Park when I was young and I really liked it mm, it is a very good film I liked this film uh, a lot. Uh, it had, you know, all the things you wanted from Jurassic Park. It had lots of like, sort of jumps and sort of tense bits and cool dinosaurs. What's interesting that I quite liked about it is that they actually don't give away a lot of the plot in the trailer. Obviously, the trailer is about they have to rescue the dinosaurs from the island that's about to erupt in a huge volcanic explosion. And that bit is really, really good. But there's quite a lot to the film other than that. I don't want to go into details because it's best if you don't know really what's going to happen, as I did going in. But as there seems to be an issue, I think, with modern trailers, that pretty much the whole film seems to be in the trailer. We saw the trailer for um, Mission Impossible Fallout, and it does look like the entire film is in the trailer. (laughs) It feels like... How much they feel the need to give away the trailer is kind of proportional to how confident they're feeling about the film's success. Like, the Marvel and Star Wars mega empires have got quite good at, well, at least quite happy to not give you that much in the trailer, apart from, look, it's the characters again. Yeah. Because they, I guess they kind of feel like you're probably going to turn out anyway. Whereas smaller, more insecure films do feel they have to give you a bit more. Yeah. I think Jurassic Park, sorry, Jurassic World was a pretty massive hit. It was, you know. I think it was in the top few box offices of that year, possibly ever. So I think it, I think I guess they felt pretty good about just going, look, it's more. Yeah, exactly. And you know, the bits on the island and the volcano are really, really impressive. But it is quite interesting that actually there is a lot more to this film than just dinosaurs on a volcano island. Come a long way from snakes on a plane, haven't we? <laughs> dinosaurs on a volcano island is a much more interesting title. But yeah, but it's good. Um, if you were on the fence, I'd recommend go to see it. Especially go see it in the cinema because it's like you, the spectacle. Really benefits from uh, seeing it in the biggest screen possible. I was kind of, I don't know, I haven't seen the first one and the reviews have been kind of lukewarm so I was probably on the, the not side of the fence but maybe on Netflix or something, who knows. Yeah. Anyway Nick, what have you been up to since we last spoke? Well, leaning into the Marvel thing early, I finished the first season of Runaways, the Marvel show based on the comic. Yes, another one. This one's about a group of kids who discover their parents are supervillains and then run away, obviously, just to try and fight them as a group of vigilantes. As luck would have it, it turns out they all have sort of powers or access to, like, gadgets or access to something they can steal from their parents that gives them a bit of an edge in a fight. So, yeah, they all have sort of different kinds of weird powers and they go on the run. That's the premise. And Runaways, the TV show, actually messes with that premise a bit, if only because... The kids don't run away for quite a long time. It's weird, actually. The thing, the comic adaptation I did not expect to run away to have a lot in common with is Preacher. But it does actually have quite a lot in common with Preacher in that it adds quite a lot of prequel material and doesn't get to the, what was the original sort of big inciting incident of the series until the very end of the first season. But I still quite liked it. It's by the showrunner of The O.C., a show I've never seen, but which my girlfriend, Julianne Bedford, has seen, and therefore she watched this with me. And she said it's very much their sort of thing, sort of shiny people having rich person angst in California. There was something quite fun about it, the quips, the melodrama, the ridiculously large houses. It does definitely have a bad case of the premium telly pacing, but despite that, I quite enjoyed it anyway. Yeah, sounds good. My girlfriend has also been watching Runaways, and she she likes it. Yeah, and also she made the um, the OC comparison, which was a show that she liked as well. So it seems to be that, like, yeah, if you graduated from teen drama to superhero show, it's the sort of thing you'd like. You know, to be fair, if so, that's a good hire by Marvel. Mm. You know, actually making it a proper teen drama is the sort of thing you should do. Although the big change they've made, possibly to fill out, you know, all this space they've created in the story, is that the parents 
the evil parents actually also have quite a big role in the plot. Because obviously there's quite a lot of them, like there's six kids, and they, with one exception, they all have two parents, so that's ten characters mm. as the parents. You know, they get quite a lot into, yeah, you know, the dynamics between the parents, who's betraying who, that sort of thing. That is, I think, one of the ways they feel this, this ten-episode season, which takes, you could argue, ten episodes to get to the point. It does take them a while to get around everyone. I guess that's a lot like most sort of character-based dramas, and it's all about the interaction between the characters and the various relationships between, like, a large group of people. I mean, if you've got like sort of time to really build up rich characterization that's the sort of thing people get can get really into when you understand the characters and see their how they react in different circumstances yeah I and mean, i think it makes the pacing seem a bit less empty than something like say iron fist which really only had about four main characters yet still stretched a very thin plot over 13 episodes and as a result it felt a bit sparse the characters weren't particularly interesting or had any interesting dynamics between them well yeah and in other ways that thing is angst <laughs> That's accessible for teenagers. Although they do swear and stuff. One could ask who this teen drama is actually aimed at, and maybe the answer is teenagers. adults who like to... But yeah, to be fair. Teenagers swear. They, they do, but they don't tend to swear in their teen dramas. So yeah, if you're if you're a teenager, and you, you must absolutely be listening to this then, <laughs> and, you, and you've been looking for a teenage drama where they can say shit, then Runaways is that show. Cool. Finally broken the, uh, the shit mark. And yeah, if you're a, te- a sort of 2000s vaguely teeny drama nostalgia person, it's made by the showrunner of the OC, and it's got James Masters from Buffy in it, so... It's a win-win. Although, they do have a bit of dialogue, one of these clever, clever bits of dialogue they have in superhero adaptations, where the kids have a discussion about how we could call ourselves the Runaways. Oh no, that's lame. You, you didn't actually need to say that. It's about the few Marvel shows which you don't have to spend time justifying the stupid name. That's a good point. That aside, it's quite good. This episode, we have not one, but two brand new comics uh, for us to review. First up, we'll be looking at The Immortal Hulk, written by Al Ewing and with art by Joe Bennett. I'm now going to hand the discussion over to Nick, as he's Mr. Comics on this podcast. So, Nick, what did you make of The Immortal Hulk? Okay, I, I, you're still allowed to like explain the plot and stuff, but cool. Uh, the Immortal Hulk is a is a horror-based relaunch of the Hulk, basically. It's slightly reimagining the character as this sort of dark spirit that rises in the night. Like, often, like Bruce Banner is killed and his body comes back to life as the Hulk to seek vengeance at night. It's that sort of thing. So it's still, you know, it's still the Hulk. There's still a guy called Bruce Banner who turns into a big green thing. But they're essentially a bit more around death and the tone of the story is a bit more sort of creepy horror. So, you know, it's it's the sort of thing you're after, I feel, in your relaunch of your long-running property. It's still recognisably the thing, but it's also a different twist or slant on the thing. And yeah, I liked it a lot. I thought it was very good. Like a lot of first issues nowadays, it definitely felt a bit like a sort of establishing preamble, but a lot of the premise here of what they're trying to do is the atmosphere. You know, a lot of what differentiates this from the rest of the Hulk comics is atmosphere, and it definitely established that atmosphere. You get a sort of a basic run through the setup. You know, the Hulk appears, he, he knows your sins. He's fully literate, interestingly. There's no Hulk smash here, and he's reverted to a slightly more simian appearance, which is similar to how he appeared in his first few Jack Kirby comics, rather than the, just a big buff dude, but green. That he later sort of turned into. That, that sort of goes along with the monsterness of it, of course. So yes, I, mean, I liked it. Long story short, I thought this was a, an interesting new twist on a character that I have not always been that interested in in the past. It did strike me very much as barring the template of the opening episode of like a serial TV show. Although it's possible that a lot of modern serial TV shows kind of borrow their opening episode template from the first issues of comics. In that the first issue has like a sort of self-contained plot um, that kind of hooks you into the concept and makes you sort of interested to read more. So there's like, yeah, there's a plot in the first one involving um, a robbery that goes wrong and some innocent people are killed and then the Hulk sort of takes revenge against the sort of low-level criminal who committed murder without really intending to. And then that kind of plot is pretty much wrapped up in the first episode and I assume like, they'll move on, to kind of establish what's going to happen in kind of each issue and then they'll, they'll move on from there. But in terms of sort of an introduction to get you establish the character and get you hooked into the plot, um, I thought it worked really well in that I was sort of intrigued by what's going to happen. I was entertained by what I read, wanted to find out what happened next. Yeah, I'm kind of curious how they're going to explore this more, you know, sort of keep it fresh and how exactly they're going to keep, you know, working this pattern. Because I assume there's going to be more to it than just a dude does something bad. Bruce Banner gets accidentally killed again, lol, sort of in a sort of vaguely Kenny from South Park way, and then he pops back up. So I'm going to assume that as we get through this, Al Ewing is going to vary the template and play with the mechanics of it and explain a bit more what's actually going on. But yeah, the big thing this time is we're quite outside the Hulk. You know, there's no narration from Bruce Banner's perspective here. We don't really, with the exception of one tiny, tiny bit at the end, see much about what his life's like or what's going on with him. And this is something that's been done before in Hulk comics. We're very much looking at things from the outside to see, you 
go, holy shit, the Hulk's quite scary, isn't he? Yeah. And obviously, you know, as I say, this is the horror Hulk, the immortal Hulk. So that's very much the main thing they have to put across. Yeah, I also, what I also liked about this is the sort of the stakes kind of felt lower, which was sort of refreshing change, especially after, I guess, watching like Infinity War when it's like the stakes are literally half of all life in the entire universe. You know, it, and obviously it's interesting, it's kind of the stakes are lower for the whole world, but I guess the stakes are obviously very, very high for the characters involved in that, you know, it's kind of life or death for them. But it was nice to have a sort of a comic story that focused very much on just a few characters and what was at risk was kind of their lives and their futures. There was no hint of the Hulk kind of having to defend the world from like a big supervillain. I assume at some point they're going to move towards like a wider plot, bringing in so a either new or I guess established Hulk villain at some point uh but there's very little of that in the first episode there's like no setup of like other super characters other than the hulk himself it's very much more like i don't know um local crime story your, your friendly neighborhood immortal hulk if <laughs> to coin a phrase I mean, if you want to relate it back to something else hulky, it's not dissimilar to the, the classic Hulk TV show with Bill Bixby on the road with his rucksack, encountering small-time hoods and then turning into a, a painted green bodybuilder and giving them a damn good fisting. Yeah, actually, you're right. It is very similar to that. And, you know, it's, again, it's different enough to that. They're not, like, doing a bit. The horror angle does make it different. There's enough discussions about whether the Hulk exists beyond death and, you know, grim pictures of bodies in the morgue and stuff to assume that they are going somewhere with the sort of resurrection horror, is he alive or is he dead angle. But there was also that sort of classic Hulk angle of Bruce Banner with his rucksack and his cap pulled down low, strolling into another town to meet some bad people and fuck them up whilst feeling a bit weird about it. Yeah, also, that because there was so little of Bruce Banner himself in it, you really get the kind of idea that what's happened is that, yeah, Bruce Banner has died in circumstances. I don't know if you were a regular reader of Hulk or Avengers comics, you might know why but I didn't know why but basically answering the big question that if Bruce Banner himself was killed does the Hulk die as well and actually the answer seems to be no if Bruce Banner dies the Hulk is the only thing that's left pretty much well yeah Bruce Banner did die it was a a big Avengers crossover a couple of years ago Bruce Banner died the Hulk came back and obviously this is the thing we need to establish but is Bruce Banner still Bruce Banner or is he just at this point basically a, a holding device for the Hulk I don't really know he still seems to have some sense of his own personhood because again he's sort of asking whether he's a good person in his tiny epilogue at the end, but what he actually is, or how he is, is kind of unclear. But yeah, in recent Hulk comics, I haven't read them, full disclosure, Hulk is not an area of comics I can actually talk about with glowing detailed expertise, because it's not a a family of comics I read extensively, but there have been quite sort of upscale sci-fi, I think. There has been quite a lot of the Hulk hanging out with other characters who have gamma radiation powers, having big crunchy fights... So yeah, there is, I think, at this point, they are sort of turning in a new direction and saying, okay, right, we're doing this now. This is tangibly different. Because, you know, the Hulk's been dead for a while. He's been sort of off the stage. So they can come back and go, right, okay, new chapter. And, you know, it's not jarringly different enough and it doesn't feel like it could be in continuity, but it's interesting enough to go, right, okay, the Hulk sort of exists in this sort of cross-section between sci-fi and horror, I suppose, and today we're doing horror, having done sci-fi for about the last 20 years. Yeah, interesting departure. It also like the um, the small town sort of vibe that it has in that it seems to be set somewhere quite remote which is i guess because a lot of comics you kind of associate them with big cities like you know obviously batman has gotham superman has metropolis the avengers at least in the film seem to be focused a lot around new york which is uh it's quite interesting they've kind of taken this to a, a small town sort of quite remote in america which kind of works with the fact that like the plot in the first one involves getting mixed up with some kind of small town gang. If you're going to do like horror again, small towns in American wilderness are great settings for horror stories because the sort of place where you could just wander into the forest and never be seen again. Kind of, yeah, lends itself to the idea of there being bad things out there that want to hurt you. Back in Twin Peaks. Yeah, so the Twin Peaks or Blair Witch or whatever. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I'm curious what, what Al Ewing has planned in terms of where he's going to take him. Obviously, he can go to a few small towns, he can go to a city, he can leave again. Al Ewing's a, a good writer, I've read his stuff before. He's quite up and coming in that he was big on the 2000 AD scene in Britain, and he's just been breaking through in America in the last few years. So I guess this is probably his biggest gig so far, and, you know, it's good. Yeah. Hopefully he'll go further. And also, Joe Bennett's odd art here, slightly echoing the discussion of the issue on a recent episode of the House to Astonish podcast, which, if you like this sort of comics chat, I highly recommend, by the way. But I I remember him from leading comics in the 2000s as a decent but not life-changing superhero artist but he has leveled up a bit here i think there's a some nicely managed sort of human emotions he gets through the whole issue without that much huge superhero stuff to draw and it's quite nicely done and atmospheric and when the hulk does appear he's 
suitably big and horrific. It is still within the sort of realistic side of cartoony superhero spectrum you see on most Marvel and DC comics. So they could have got someone with a slightly inkier, more sort of abstract or atmospheric horror style. But, I don't know, part of me kind of likes that they've kept it vaguely superhero-y, just to remind us this is still the main Hulk comic. But yeah, I liked the art, I thought it was good. I thought the two double-page spreads that brought the Hulk in were particularly good. Yeah, yeah, I liked it as well. I thought it was a good intro. If you haven't read Hulk comics before or many superhero comics, it's probably a good place to start because they've reset the timeline and introduced a new dynamic. Yeah, but this is part of a general Marvel relaunch thing and there are a few interesting comics coming up, but yeah. Since I haven't read the Hulk for a long time and I always enjoy checking out Al Ewing stuff, I thought, you know, let's give this a go. But yeah, despite not being a huge Hulk person, I will probably definitely need more of this. It was good fun. Okay, and from one very strong dude to another still quite strong dude, although Hulk is of course the strongest one there is, we're now going to talk about Man of Steel number one, the latest relaunch of Superman. This is the start of a weekly miniseries by writer Brian Michael Bendis, and there's actually going to be a different artist every issue, but we're only looking at issue one, drawn by Ivan Rice, and this leads into Brian Michael Bendis launching two separate Superman monthly series coming out of this, one looking at Superman, the other sort of focusing more on the the Clark Kenty stuff. But anyway, we're not looking at any of that. We're just looking at Man of Steel number one, which came out a few weeks back and introduces, well, mostly just reintroduces Superman as, you know, a good chap in Metropolis and vaguely sets up this new villain who seems to exist largely in the past. So yeah, Alistair, what did you make of this? I'm sure you know who Superman is. Yes, I am familiar with the, with the Man of Steel. And I can confirm that this is better than the film of that name. Yes, this is definitely more what I want for my Superman than any of the Zack Snyder stuff was, yeah. Yeah, this is a good bit of Superman. Like I say, he's not moody and and sort of wandering around his fortress of solitude going, I'm so lonely, no one understands. <laughs> <laughs> no one understands what it's like to be this iconic symbol of justice. We'll probably shouldn't live in the North Pole, maybe. But anyway, this is, I guess, kind of what I'd expect Superman to be like, I get more, in that he's a general all-American dude. He spends his time saving children and puppies. He does save some puppies at one point in this comic. And, you know, sort of fighting nasty villains in Metropolis. I mean, and he's got, I think, as we said before, the kind of more dad-like tone of Superman, which is something you've mentioned, like the sort of tone they get for Superman in the Supergirl TV show. So rather than Zack Snyder's kind of mopey Superman, he's kind of like, I don't know, a parental figure. In fact, there's some flashbacks to him literally having, you know, been married to Lois Lane and having a child. So it's very much a Superman is the kind of father figure of like the whole country in the sense that he's like the big strong one we all look up to and look to to keep us safe. After we've had, I think, too much kind of dark and moody Superman, more dark and moody Superman than anyone really needed. This was a refreshing refreshing change. I did at one point refer to this version of Superman as a very your dad, with those two words capitalised, figure. So yeah, <laughs> you're cool. But yeah, no, I think the main appeal of this comic to me was, as you kind of said, the take on Superman. The way they managed to, I think, put off the sort of, he's a nice guy, but he's not a boring stuffed shirt guy. He's got this sort of gentle, dry, even occasionally very, very slightly sarcastic sense of humour. He's got this sort of self-awareness. He wrestles with being just a person and being the icon, but at the same time, he doesn't wrestle with it to the degree that he's, you know, angstily staring at his feet. He's active, he's doing his best, he, he he's very, very likeable. There's not a lot else to this comic, to be honest, but it does give you a few good long scenes in which Superman is superman It does let you come away with a sort of a nice warm glow, and it sort of gently introduces a few plot threads for I'm assuming considering this is the start of a six issue story leading on to two separate ongoing comics are all things that Brian Bendis will be picking up as he goes. So yeah this is very much a sort of a nice teaser to a an episode or a run or something. I felt if what he was trying to sell me on was the take, then it has sold me on the take. I could have perhaps done with a bit more of a plot as well as a take, but I am nonetheless kind of interested. They threw out a lot of threads. Like, if the Mortal Hulk kind of was like a first episode of a TV show, this is kind of like, I don't know, the first episode of a TV show that focused very heavily on arc plot in that it throws out a lot of threads that could be picked up, such as there seems to be like a wave of arsons going on in Metropolis. Yeah. Yeah, and there's an idea that Superman is going to be looking into it from a sort of superhero perspective and Clark Kent is investigating it from a sort of journalist perspective. And I assume there's going to be more to it than just like some pyromaniac has set fire to a couple of buildings so there's like a lot of threads thrown out and also they've introduced what i assume is a new character of this new deputy fire marshal yeah she is as far as i'm aware new i did read superman comics a couple of years back but it's been a while now but yeah i, I think that's a new character she gets about three pages out of the 20 page comic including one page which exists just to show her having a slightly awkward moment with superman yeah so if she's not a major new character then that was a bit of a waste of space they've also gone for the interesting visual parallel of having a firewoman with like bright red hair see 
she's a she's a fiery redhead. <laughs> Boom cha. But yeah, I mean, it is kind of a. I mean, I'd say it's less for me. It was less the first episode of an arc-driven TV show, and more, to be honest, a bit before the credits of an arc-driven TV show. Like, I feel like if you actually dramatise this in real time, you know, by filming it for TV or film, it would probably only last about five six minutes. Yeah, maybe ten. I I do get the feeling, but if I want to get the full story, I probably need to buy the full six issue mini series, or at least about half of it whereas the immortal hulk did at least give us a full story yeah again the difference between i guess the show that you know kind of does like a self-contained plot in the pilot and one that basically like their pilot exists to introduce a character and throw out a lot of stuff that's there to pick you up and could become future plot lines but that's not a criticism that's just sort of a statement of fact and i did like it and the stuff that it kind of threw out was interesting i was mainly on board for this for kind of a traditional take on superman i think what i liked the most about it was like yeah superman being superman and not being angst-ridden was what I liked the most about it. The introduction of this kind of new villain, yeah, like you say, there's kind of flashbacks to before Krypton was destroyed with the introduction of, yeah, a new a new villain who has some kind of grudge against the whole planet, who I guess assume that plot in the past will collide with Superman in the present. It was interesting and it you know kind of built up some tension and obviously there's a new super villain you want to see what happens when he confronts superman although it did suffer from some of my least favorite kind of sci-fi cliches such as basically his his main grudge against krypton seems to be something to do with trade policies (laughs) (laughs) which is again just like horror ridden flashbacks to um phantom menace when they start banging on about trade routes and trade federations it's kind of like i mean i know they kind of want to base their galactic politics in something that kind of vaguely resembles either our politics of the presence or what has promoted wars and conflicts in the past such as you know like trade routes and and trade policy but first of all i always find a thing that far future civilizations are likely to have quite different politics to ask because like trade probably isn't an issue when you can go anywhere in the universe and just take any natural resource from you know like asteroids and I would like, you know, maybe people to be more creative and original with how galactic politics would work. And also a character who just basically wants to moan about trade makes me think he's just kind of a superpower Donald Trump. The man who doesn't the real problem is his Krypton's been screwing us over with these trade deals. It's not fair. Akin to the Donald Trump comparison, I'm going to guess the reveal we're probably building up to with that dude is that he doesn't actually care that much about trade. He's just gigantically racist. Yeah, I guess so. I'm going to guess that's where we're going with that because a lot of his sort of, oh, they just take and take and take i don't know i i don't know whether ben this is going for actually he has a valid point or he's just a, a rationalizing racist i would have to read the rest of the story to tell you that but that's kind of what i read into it yeah i mean it's, it's interesting it could go in one of several directions I mean, it's interesting also if in there has been a sort of a prequel story published which i have not read because it was in a comic i don't have access to which imply that what they're actually building to is that this guy is actually the guy who originally was responsible for destroying krypton we just didn't know until now yeah i got that okay which is on the one hand you know i guess it's you know it's a quick way of making it personal between him and superman yeah and on the other hand it's a, a bit of a weird massive change to make to a classic story but yeah get your drama in there somehow yeah i pick, i picked up that basically they're kind of digging more into the events that led up to the collapse of the core of krypton if I can remember Superman films. Yeah, and obviously previously they've lent on the Kryptons became a bit hubristic and mined the core of their own planet, which was a bad idea, and it collapsed. Which again is a bit silly because like there's lots of dead planets in the universe and if you can travel through space, you can mine the core of any of those. And also there are bits of planets floating around when you don't have to go into the core, they're just out there. I guess this is kind of building, going to dramatise more into what actually happened and I guess building up to the reveal that it was a plot to deliberately destroy Krypton, not hubris. Yeah, which since, as you say, it's fairly obvious and has been, you know, advertised in other prequel stories i'm assuming they're going to get to that fairly quickly in this six issue story rather than drag it out for years but we'll see yeah but yeah as you say i'm interested by that i too was not at my most enraptured by the space sci-fi sequences with that character although i thought the art did a nice job of selling it i thought the art and the coloring as well did a nice job of slightly forestalling my disinterest in the sci-fi sequences by making them look really cool yeah it was certainly beautiful to look at so that helped if i'm not that inspired by the design of that character i think he looks like a bit of a generic big comics evil dude but it's hard to really judge too much having seen two tiny prequel sequences i would need to read the west and see where ben this is going with it which i probably eventually will single comics are a bit expensive nowadays and committing to a weekly six issue story at full price is something i slightly balk at i guess it has to be really really good and this was good but i don't know if it jumps to really really good i suspect we're getting into wait for a comicsology sale in down the line realistically i'll probably be able to get the entire thing for like three quid in about six to nine months and i'm probably willing to wait whereas the, the immortal hulk i am genuinely tempted to just come back next month and buy the thing because i am kind of curious where al ewing is going with it was this 
It's good, but it's not. Holy shit, I must have the next issue now. Good. Yeah, I think this is one to kind of wait and see. I'm not as sold on it as I was on Immortal Hulk. But that, it was good. And I just, yeah, I did like the fact that, like, we're getting back to more traditional Superman, which I think is good for the character. Next up, this episode, we'll be taking a step back to look at the biggest rivalry in comics of all time, Marvel versus DC. Across comics, film, TV and games, this rivalry has run for decades. It will likely never be settled. (laughs) And we have now read two new comics from both publishers. Interestingly, they're both relaunches of well-known, well-established, you could say classic characters. So I think this is a good opportunity to compare and contrast both these two comics and the kind of output in general. So I guess a good place to start would be, Nick, what did you prefer, Man of Steel or Immortal Hulk? Um, as I think we established during the Man of Steel discussion, I preferred Immortal Hulk. I am in my mid-30s, hi. And I have I've reached a stage where, yes, I, I am more in for a creator's interesting or idiosyncratic take on a character than I am for what is a, a, a decent, but ultimately still quite a house-style version of a character. I will still read the house-style, but I will often pick it up for 20p in a comicsology sale instead of getting excited and buying it on release day. So, yeah, I am more an Immortal Hulk kind of guy. I think Al Ewing does a good job always of bringing a bit of style and a bit of verve to stuff because I've read some of his other stuff as well like I said he's got a series called Ultimates which he did a couple of years back I think you do have to be a bit of a Marvel nerd basically to, to fully get what he's doing with that but it is very good I mean I think that's the um, the crucial distinction here is that they are doing a new take on an established character versus DC who are basically doing an established take on an established character which there's nothing wrong with that when it's done well but yeah I think it's from a Okay, and an analyst perspective, it's more interesting to kind of find a new take on an established character. For the comic fans in the house, a lot of the interest in Man of Steel was actually the fact that writer Brian Bendis was a major Marvel writer for a long time. Between 15 and 20 years, I think? And this is his first DC work. He jumped ship from Marvel to DC about three, about three or four months ago, and this is his first DC job. So for a lot of people, the interest here is less what crazy thing will happen to Superman, and more, what's it like when Brian Bendis writes Superman? To which the answer is, yeah, pretty good. Actually, Bendis has done so much Marvel that even you've read some Bendis. He wrote um, Ultimate Spider-Man. Oh, yes, that was really good. Yes, uh, as a Spider-Nerd, I prefer his Spider-Man to be Superman, but yes, he's he's a reliable guy. It's, it's, there's a reason why he was huge at Marvel for a long time, and why him moving from Marvel to DC is a big deal. Yeah, that's interesting. He also created Jessica Jones, although he didn't actually work on the TV show. That is, again, that is a big accomplishment. Well, I guess one of the other crucial differences between these two is that the Immortal Hulk doesn't have any other sort of super characters in it, whereas uh, Man of Steel sets up this like, very deliberate super dynamic. There's like a superhero and they're setting up like a super villain, and obviously they'll clash, which I think is, is interesting in that. It'd be nice if they did like the Immortal Hulk as a whole thing when just he kind of fights like sort of gangsters and wrong uns across some you know <laughs> wrong uns in rural america rather than like it's it's, it's funny because it's something that the hulk would never say yeah yeah but having heard al ewing talk at panels it is probably something he'd say yeah but rather than like i kind of guess them introducing uh i don't actually know any any hulk villains i can't remember the leader the abomination oh it's the abomination obviously yeah yeah he was in that edward norton hulk film yeah I, I don't know i think they're doing something again a bit different in that way i think that is often seen as the difference between marvel and dc if you just want to make a back of the envelope comparison marvel does make something out of the fact that it's the heroes that exist in the real world mm. and dc a lot of the time heroes do exist on this sort of olympus like plateau where they talk mostly to each other yeah it's interesting actually in some ways that a lot of the the marvel cinematic universe stuff sometimes seems a bit more heroes exist on a plane of only heroes compared to dc i mean there are exceptions like spider-man homecoming but still i guess because they've gone with this whole thing in the films of they don't have secret identities everyone knows who iron man is everyone knows who captain america is and so i guess there's an element of like if you're well known as like a superhero you would just be like exist in a different world to the average person you know like the concept that like steve rogers pops down to the shops for like milk and some bread (laughs) is like it's just it just does not work in any way shape or form it's like even like in the films when they try their best like i think in the winter soldier when he's just got like an apartment and there's like a nurse who lives next door i was a bit like this strikes me as like way too mundane for what would be allowed for like kind of one of the most powerful people in the world would just like have an apartment in a in a townhouse in in dc and sure enough the nurse turned out to be a spy yeah exactly yeah i I think it makes sense if you if you want to make it vaguely believable there has to be a thing in which they live in their super base with their other superpowers because like you know i don't see um tony stark just like going to his local cinema to watch jurassic world fallen kingdom (laughs) 
No, I think you just had it brought to him. But I, I, I always feel bad saying things are better, but I always feel like the Marvel stuff has something a bit more visceral and interesting to it as a result, although DC does do a good line in epic I mean, possibly that's one of the reasons why Marvel had a bit of a, a comics low point in the last couple of years before they did the current relaunch. They did get a bit carried away with superhero on superhero action and things felt started to feel a bit distant from reality, which is where Marvel lives and does well. And they're now very consciously doing things like the Immortal Hulk, where they're getting a bit more into the characters having individual worlds and individual supporting casts that are a bit removed from the general super world. Or but possibly that's a bit of a broad generalisation based on a lot of comics that I haven't actually read. Yeah, well, also, you can see it in these two issues, in that Man of Steel is keen to drop references to the other um, members of the Justice League. There's a bit when Superman says, like, you know, Batman drops people. He's picking up and flying with a a villain he's just apprehended, and he makes a joke about how Batman would drop him or something like that. And the new deputy fire chief they've introduced, one of the first things she says is, am I taller than Wonder Woman? (laughs) So they're quite keen to establish that, yeah, this is the DC universe. Batman and Wonder Woman are out there, and, you know, they're all pals. Whereas, yeah, I think other than one passing reference to the Avengers, I think there was no mention of the wider universe in Immortal Hulk. No, no, probably not. I mean, yeah, I think that's why I've always preferred Marvel. But obviously, I've always, as I've said before, I always liked Spider-Man, and Spider-Man has always been particularly big on the I'm just a guy, I don't exist on this Olympus-like higher level. I actually do have to go to the shops to buy milk. Yeah, because he's a friendly neighbourhood Spider-Man. And he's the most popular Marvel character, and he sort of embodies that in a way. And he does have a secret identity, unlike... You know, Iron Man or Captain America. Yeah, so they even kept it in the films, which was why that film was amazing. I will, I'll fly the flag for Spider-Man Homecoming till I finally die. Yeah, or the second one comes out. God, I really hope that's good. But anyway. Well, again, comparing these two comics, one thing I would say is that like, the DC one I thought was more fun in that it had like some jokes that made me laugh and kind of just a general sense of like super adventure fullness which is one interesting thing to point out because i think it's uh it's ironic that i'm actually saying yeah we looked in a marvel and a dc thing and the dc one was more fun because it's not often you get to say that when the dc stuff is done well and you know well i preferred the hulk i think the man of steel was dc done well it is kind of fun there is something kind of whimsical and off the wall and light and you know these things happen and the characters sort of take them in their stride and smile at them but it is fun i mean it's one of the reasons why those films are not particularly good adaptations of the material and it's one of the reasons why a lot of people don't like them <laughs> Because I think this stuff being fun and the characters having this sort of knowing attitude and enjoying it is one of the things that's good. And one of the reasons why the TV shows, the CW Flash Arrow ones, are often better. Yeah, that seems to be the aspect that people prefer. In that, like, a lot of people seem to, like, think that DC does TV very well. And Marvel is sort of, like, running to catch up. Although I haven't seen many DC TV shows. I've seen quite a few of the Marvel ones. Like, mainly the Netflix ones. Marvel haven't really quite got that sense of fun. Marvel, weirdly, seem very wed to this sort of sense of stodgy premiumness in their TV output. Whereas DC seems to be willing to have a bit more of a laugh. It's a weird, as you, as you say, basically. It's a, it's a weird role reversal. But yeah, I mean... A lot of DC comics do sort of go with that sort of house style. A lot of their weirder experiments or total shifts tend to be combined to these sort of prestige graphic novels or whatever, rather than just being stuck in the monthly comics, or they're like separate series, which are later collected as separate graphic novels, which is one way they kind of end up having it over Marvel in the long term. A lot of the more interesting DC stuff is nicely self-contained. You know, you could just say, read Batman Arkham Asylum, it's good. That wasn't like four issues of Batman, that was just a separate graphic novel. With Marvel, you sometimes get this sort of sense of, well, to read the good thing I like, you have to read issues 5 to 43 of Daredevil, Daredevil read all just review number 1, you have to read those 20 issues, and then you have to continue into this Black Widow miniseries, and then you have an aneurysm and die. It's not very accessible for someone who doesn't know comics as well, in that it's hard to get into something when you, unless you've got on hand uh, a sort of noted lifelong comics expert who can just tell you specifically Hi. what to buy and even just send you the comicsology links um, to make it all easier. I guess that's one of the reasons why I think the first comics that I read, even before we did the podcast back at university, were Batman graphic novels because I, you know, I just borrowed from a friend the complete Nightfall, just bound in one volume, or the complete long halloween because yeah it's kind of it's an accessible point people like you like christopher nolan batman movies here read this i can give it to you in a book right now rather than having to you have to search on the internet to find you know a collection of you know sort of the yeah to to do the process you just described a lot of people end up kind of i don't know i don't think that many of the actual monthly superhero comics from dc end up becoming like mainstays in a lot of senses except maybe like occasional big stories like nightfall whereas marvel are better at doing these fun style experiments but they end up sort of buried in the run which to be honest might explain why marvel generally sell a lot more single issues and dc tends to do quite a lot better on 
books for the most part. I mean, I think it does make it more accessible. And I guess also DC has, well, until the last 10 years, I'd say, DC has had the most well-known characters like Batman, Superman. Certainly Batman is a character that seems to like struck a chord with the kind of post 9-11 world, a sort of darker tone. Yeah, I don't know where we reached this sort of peak ubiquitous Batman stage. I guess it was somewhere around the sort of, yeah, the combination of the darkening world, the teenage readership and the Dark Knight films. Yeah, although I think with the benefit of high insight, I think most of this can be explained by how good Christopher Nolan was as a filmmaker rather than something like innate about Batman that really resonates with people because when other people try to repeat the success of Christopher Nolan first with other DC characters like Man of Steel for example and then later with Batman himself in Batman vs Superman and Justice League it's just not worked and I think that's it's not because there's something innate about the kind of Batman aesthetic or even the Batman character itself that really resonates with the public I think it's just Christopher Nolan is a good filmmaker and managed to really get something that resonated with people for three films so I think actually a lot of the kind of the Batmanification of pop culture is kind of because Christopher Nolan made some great films. I do basically agree with that, although I do think something iconic about Batman has clearly resonated. I mean, the one thing DC seems to often have over Marvel, no matter how hard Marvel tries, is that their characters seem to fit more easily as these sort of massive icons, which weirdly makes them more appealing as these sort of things to really latch onto, but often makes it harder to tell actual stories about them. Who knows? Which is interesting because all the DC characters have secret identities. But as we said, you know, with, with Spider-Man, the way Spider-Man really works is that you can tell a superhero story and a story about Peter Parker and then kind of bleed the two together. And I think as we said, the Spider-Man homecoming is kind of the sort of tour de force of that. It worked really, really well, and partly because of the twist, which there's no point in spoiling here. It's kind of weird that DC can do that because like you say, like Bruce Wayne has a life outside Batman and Clark Kent has a life you know, outside Superman, but instead they're kind of more keen on sticking to characters on top of Mount Olympus and kind of weirdly making the real world identities also kind of vaguely inapproachable and unknowable as well. So I don't really know why they've done that. I mean, the, the rote thing people say about that is for, you know, for Marvel, it's like Peter Parker is Spider-Man, Tony Stark is Iron Man. Whereas with DC, it's more Batman is also Bruce Wayne. Superman is also Clark Kent and you know there's a vague sense that with DC the super identity is the real person and, and the secret identity is just a mask they occasionally put on when they need to do other things or when they just want to damn break and you know there's there's hours of brain stopping pop psychology written about the idea that Batman is the real person and Bruce Wayne is the mask but it does seem to be a, an ongoing thing that stops people ever really wanting to do a really in-depth Bruce Wayne story. Yeah you hit the nail on the head there that is kind of the crucial difference between the two stables whereas there is you know even like Steve Rogers even though he is Captain America he does still seem a bit like Steve Rogers like I say it was why it's not utterly ridiculous that he can like live in an apartment and like have a sort of flirty relationship you know with his neighbour when they're also using the, the laundrette although it, on some level it's ridiculous it, it's sort of it works more than like the concept of running into Batman in your laundrette oh well, yeah I mean, a, a lot of whole Batman stories it feels like the only time you ever see Bruce Wayne is when he's sitting in his bat cave, still dressed in his bat Batman costume with his hood down having a chat to Alfred and that's you know that's barely Bruce Wayne that's basically just casual Batman yeah or like I don't know in the the films when uh, especially like the Nolan films when he's required to do some form of politicking because of like some connection to like what's wider going on in in Gotham or there's a bit when basically he has to go out and be obnoxious Bruce Wayne you know to kind of distract from Batman although even by the third one they've hit on the point that Bruce Wayne has become a recluse so that's the point where there's basically kind of almost no need for the character of Bruce Wayne because he sort of like ceased to exist yeah well I did enjoy the bits of play acting they did in those films where Christian Bale would you know pretend to be well Christian Bale would play Bruce Wayne clearly pretending to be this comedy drunken idiot playboy just to get people off his back that was quite funny yeah but yeah I will forever be a Marvel kid but there is something DC do have that Marvel don't have and I don't know if it makes for the most interesting stories it's you know it's always fun to visit it sometimes I think they have these very iconic characters I think as we said they've cleverly taken like iconic stories with their iconic characters and packaged them into easily purchasable shareable and consumable graphic novels as especially which is a good way in if you're someone like me who's read a lot of books but not much comics and finds a kind of like I don't know just finds it more accessible for someone to give me a book to read. Although the advent of comicsology has made it easier because I can download vast quantities of stuff onto like an iPad and then read it like a book. Like when I read Uber after we did it on this podcast, I approached it very much like a book. I bought all the issues and then sat down and read, rather than reading them weekly or monthly as they came out, I read it like from cover to cover as I would a book. I think maybe, like you say, we've hit on something that if Marvel kind of struggled maybe with the packaging a bit. There's just a lot of series with long volume numbers and they reset the volume numbers when a new writer comes on, but that just means 
means now there's 17 different Hulk volume ones, and that doesn't make it any less confusing. Yeah. Ever since Marvel went big in on paperback collections about 15-ish years ago, they've struggled with that, and I don't have a magic solution. Yeah. Sorry, guys. Yeah. Well, overall, I thought that Marvel of the better films, and certainly from my point of view, the better TV, but DC of the better known characters, so I don't know. Maybe we'll call it a draw. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, why not? That'll probably at least stop us getting sniped in the head. Okay, thank you for joining us for Moderate Fantasy Violence's one-off The Invention as a Comics podcast. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. If you want still more Moderate Fantasy Violence content, you can find us at moderatefantasyviolence.com on the internet, where there are short articles, other episodes, deleted scenes from old episodes, all sorts of stuff. And if you particularly enjoy this podcast, then please take the time to review us on iTunes, or other podcast outlets, but mostly iTunes. And say something nice so other people can find the show. You can also find us on social media. On Twitter, we are at MFV Podcast. And on Facebook, you can search for Moderate Fantasy Violence and follow us there. I've been Alistair Ball. If you want more from me, you can find me on Twitter at Alistair J.R. Ball. Or you can find more of my writing at redtrainblog.com. And I've been Nick Bryan. You can find more from me on the internet at nickbryan.com or on Twitter at, at NickMB, where I talk a bit about my life, my writing, what I think of various TV shows, the recent release of my latest crime book in my Hobson and Choice series, my comic stuff, all sorts of things. Also, I've been using Instagram a bit more lately, so follow me there on nickbryan.com. Yes, that's nickbryan.com all written out because I can't remember why I failed to get a good name. Anyway, that's all for this fortnight. We'll see you back here in two weeks' time when, continuing the general ongoing theme of franchises and Marvel and such, we will be covering the second season of Luke Cage. See you then. Goodbye. Bye. Inedible Hulk. No, sorry, the Immortal <laughs> Hulk. Yeah, there's the, uh, the amount of times I'm going to accidentally refer, use the wrong adjective for this is going to be unbearable. Yeah. Historically, it's the Incredible Hulk. It was also the Indestructible Hulk for a while, and now it's the Immortal Hulk. I guess <laughs> I assume at no point it, never, it wasn't actually called the Inedible Hulk because <laughs> I mean, be dis- it goes without saying that he's inedible. I'm going to be disappointed that at some point somebody in a comic hasn't made that joke. You know. Like a giant tries to eat him and it turns out he's the inedible Hulk or something. But no, it's ne- the comic has never been called that. Well, he is green like a giant broccoli. And broccoli is inedible. Good point. Okay. Well, now we've cleared that up. First up this episode, we'll be reviewing the... No, no, no. What am I, what am I going to say? Got in your head there. <laughs> <laughs> this is, you, you've cursed us now. You've cursed us. <laughs>